A couple of weeks or so ago, or like last month depending on when this video comes out, at this rate I'm not really known for making my videos out on time. I was browsing through the internet and YouTube out of boredom, not really knowing what my next video should be about, which is pretty much all of them now that I think about it. Actually, this was several weeks ago. Thanks school, you ruined everything for me. But that is when I stumbled upon a video by Mauricio Hare about Arcane Studios' cancelled Half-Life game, Return to Ravenholm. I also mentioned this cancelled project in this Half-Life video I made, which you can go watch here. After watching Mauricio Hare's video on it, it did make me think about the short-lived project for a little bit. Again, which got me pretty sad and then fucking pissed off again. The fact that Arcane Studios almost made a Half-Life game is the reason I can't sleep at night. Every night is nothing but misery and pain. PAIN! So after that, my solution to calming myself down was by playing some good old Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. <laughs> now Might and Magic is actually a role-playing game series which was purchased by Ubisoft in 2003. I can't say much on the franchise just because I don't play Might and Magic and I'm not really interested in it. I guess this is the only game in the series that I'm actually interested in, which was also made by Arcane Studios for the Source Engine. I totally didn't plan this. Also, just look at how many games there are. I'm not playing all of that. Especially since Ubisoft acquires the franchise now, which has some red flags already. Maybe somebody in the comments can give me some suggestions or a reason to play some of them, but as of right now, I'm good. Also, it says here on the Wikipedia page or whatever that it's a spinoff, so uh, I think I'm good in this regard. So what is Dark Messiah? Well, it's a linear RPG immersive sim built on the Source Engine developed by Arcane Studios, the people who would later make this on it, and Floodgate Entertainment, founded by a few former employees of Looking Glass Studios who worked on the first System Shock and Thief. I actually remember watching the E3 demos for this game and how it showed there were so many different ways to handle the situation. Okay, I didn't watch it the day it came out, but it was on the internet. To make a short story even shorter, I fell in love with these gameplay showcases because the sandbox seemed unbelievably awesome and endless. Every encounter in this game feels like it could be part of an E3 showcase. You know, if developers actually didn't lie about their games. But before we get to that, how is the story? So the plot of the game is that you play as Seth. Your master is a wizard named Fangrick, and he sends you to a city called Stonehill to receive the Skull of Shadows. There's a bit more than that, but that's about my understanding of the story. I'm gonna be real with you guys, I didn't give a flying fuck about what happened in this plot or its characters. Okay, it wasn't that bad, or even boring for that matter, it's more on the side of me just not caring. But seriously though, some of this shit seems like it was written by a middle schooler. The most noticeable characters of the story, or the only characters you will remember, are Leanna and Xana. Both ending with A's. Hm. Xana is basically a succubus version of Cortana, while Leanna is a Alex wannabe from Half-Life 2. To be even more honest, I actually hate Leanna more than Alex. Over a period of time throughout the game, you eventually have to side with one of them, this being a black or white choice. Leanna is basically like that one girl you knew a long ways back who didn't cause or get into trouble, and while Xana is a fucking demon! Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, you're also like a half-demon, half-human, and some of the devil who looks like he's from Bionicle. <laughs> <laughs> now, your decision may be determined by whichever one is the hottest, or how Leanna is a FUCKING BITCH THAT KEEPS DYING ON ME! The voice acting is cheesy and just awkward at times. The worst one by far, in my opinion, being Seraph. He sounds like an alien that just discovered planet Earth. I'm sorry. I made it there, but those damn goblins have taken control of the portcullis. But, I'm not really here to discuss that. The only reason I still think about this game from time to time is because of the gameplay. Holy crap, the gameplay. Which is way more interesting than the story itself. Uncle! No. No! <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> This may be a huge hot take, but this is the best gameplay I've ever experienced in the Source Engine. Don't believe me? DUDE! Have you ever wanted to kick an enormous spider off of your fucking roof? No? Yeah, me neither, actually. But that was the case until I played this game that I knew I wanted that. To explain how Dark Messiah's gameplay is like, it's an immersive sim that gives you a sandbox and tools to handle a situation or combat in multiple ways. When you load back, you'll notice that you could have done this or that or several different other things. 
Arcane Studios are really good at making me want to go back and do the same thing again, whether I achieve my goal or not. To the point where I'm starting to think they might put magic in it. That was so awful that I will now be deleting my YouTube channel. There are so many environmental hazards like spikes, props, wooden planks, loose ones, support beams, rope, fire, etc. Along with this, you get varied weapons. Magic spells, swords, bows, daggers, armor, health, and mana potions. Also, on top of that, these weapons are very satisfying to use. In my opinion, not as good as the sandbox, but you get the idea. There are skill points you can get after completing an objective, which you can use to expand on character builds, like magic and stuff. So with a satisfying swordplay and a sandbox to mess around with, you have a case of crack addiction gameplay. Oh yeah! How could I forget about the legendary kick in this game? Ow! This kick mechanic will be your best friend and most likely the only thing you will use in Dark Messiah. It has spoiled me so much that when I tried replaying Design 1 again, I kept massing my F key and then realizing that there was no kick mechanic in the game. It should have had one. At least there's one in the sequel. Seeing a ragdoll fly across the screen out of control is one of the best feelings you can get in this game. I have too much footage of me kicking everything and everyone I came across in my playthroughs. It truly is one of the greatest kicks in a video game. It has saved me in a lot of situations, and it will for you too. By the way, thanks to the Source Engine, Arcane will never be able to top these physics, like, ever again. <laughs> Speaking of the Source Engine, the game looks beautiful at times, especially with Half-Life 2's Lost Coast introduction to high dynamic range lighting. Also, the sound effects and design are well made and put together. I didn't know the Citadel was in this game. Okay, well, close enough. Obviously, being on the Source Engine means you may see some returning assets or other such things from other Source games, like, I don't know, Half-Life 2 for an example. A random example is the developer console. You type up Noclip, you're going to Noclip. Typing up third person gets you... Oh my god! From a technical standpoint, Arcane went above and beyond with the Source Engine, and is honestly at times very impressive. Heck, the game amazes me more than what I see in most modern games nowadays. You could also see this in Arcane's cancelled project with impressive showcases, like how Father Gregory chops up this headcrab. Now keep this in mind, this was way back in 2006, and this is what they were doing. I mean, what was Valve doing during this time anyways with their engine? Um, is that seriously it? C come on, I know they were doing something else. Okay, okay, good point. Gary's mod is a good example of this. Though it was already a Half-Life 2 mod in 2004 and it wasn't created by Valve, they published it in 2006. I see that as more of a face punch accomplishment, but I'll allow it. Did Valve do anything else? I JUST KILLED LARRY THE CABLE GUY! <laughs> okay. Okay. So, <laughs> not that impressive compared to, uh, Dark Messiah. Now that is not to say that Dark Messiah is perfect. Far from it, if, if you couldn't tell. For example, in the cutscenes, yes there are pre rendered cutscenes, don't ask. You could set your audio levels to the lowest possible settings, but it won't affect the cutscenes at all. I'm sending you to the free city of Stonehelm to meet a sorcerer named Menelag. He and I have certain shared allegiances. Right now, he's looking for an artifact called the Skull of Sh Also, there's a lot of jankiness to this game. I don't know if it's due to the lack of updates and it being left behind on Steam, or if Arcane was pushing the Source Engine too much. Now that I think about it, probably both. It's mainly just the little thing, it's like a spell probably not hitting its mark or something like that. Of course, some huge technical problems being things like the game just crashing for no reason all the time. Also, when the game crashes, this little pop-up comes on screen and holy crap, look at this! It actually has the trademark Half-Life right there! Even though Ravenholm was cancelled, Arcane technically got the word Half-Life in one of the games. 
Actually, wait, no, no, no. This this actually makes me more depressed now. God damn it! The only solution I can somewhat give to prevent some of these crashes from happening are for the loading transitions. Here's my solution. This may or may not work for you, please don't sue me. If the game crashes during the load screen, especially on chapter 4 for me, load back before that, turn all of your graphical settings to low, and that should work. Should work. Then after that, you can turn it back on and continue onwards. If the same thing happens again during a different load screen, you should know the drill by now and just do the same thing as before. I don't know what is causing this, if it is all the settings or something in particular. Either way, I'm not figuring it out because of being lazy and could spend my time on something way more meaningful. Which is bitch and complain about fictional media, of course. Some other issues being the game balance being too unforgiving. Now, this is coming from me, a guy who loves to play a lot of games on the hardest difficulty. But hardcore mode is actually impossible. You die in like two hits while the enemies are fucking sponges. Hard is better than hardcore, but not by much, and it's still frustratingly unfun. This is a rare case for me because I'm not really a pussy who backs down from a difficult challenge, but honestly, if you actually want to have fun with this game, just go play on normal. Sadly enough, normal can still be annoyingly frustrating, but just be glad that you are not playing on hardcore mode. The level design is kind of all over the place. A lot of the time, it is straightforward and not too difficult. Like this bright light up here. That is good level design with the lighting telling the player that they need to go up there. But then there are some chapters where you say to yourself, Where the fuck do I go? Or, What the fuck am I doing again? In this part, you would think you would have to hold out, kill all the ghouls in some waves, and I guess wait for somebody to open a door in a sequence or something? I don't know. Well, all that is completely wrong. You shoot your bow up here and climb up the rope. Really, guys? What was the point of that arena, then? Of course, the story is also a problem, but I already established that, so moving on. But believe it or not, this game has multiplayer. Surprisingly. I've seen and read reviews that say the multiplayer wasn't that good and felt quickly made. Me, on the other hand, I think it looks cool. Now, hold on, I said it looked cool. Didn't say it was perfect or good. The multiplayer was actually not developed by Arcane Studios, but from a British company over at Kujo Entertainment. They are known for their works in both Battalion Wars, this one Warhammer 40k game called Fire Warrior, assisted on Call of Duty Finest Hour, okay, okay, and they also worked on, um... 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 Rail Simulator! The why Kuju Entertainment worked on the multiplayer was because Arkane didn't have time to work on one, so they got these guys instead. But that doesn't explain why they picked these guys specifically. Whatever, let's just see the game. So, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I was pretty excited to play this in more of Dark Messiah. I got my Rosetta Stone USB headset on, and I was ready to troll people like I normally do in my spare time. But then... I don't know shit about this. It... What? What the fuck is this? Yeah, that's when I discovered that all the servers for this game were down. Now, apparently, there are some fan dedicated servers trying to keep this dead patient alive, but I haven't been able to get a game with any players in it. I did, however, get an IP address for a North American server and added that to my favorite, but yeah, nobody's gonna come in. Look, see? Somebody even confirmed it to me on Discord that this game is dead. It's a damn shame too, because this actually looks amazing to play on. Just imagine getting some friends and people together and going wild on some of these maps. But, the party's over, and everyone went home already. The only thing I'm doing is just looking at the aftermath. And honestly, maybe I should have gone home a long time ago. This game was also ported to the 360. The first copy of Dark Messiah that I actually got to see in person was that version of the game, the port being titled Dark Messiah of Might and Magic Elements. Is that really what they called it? Seriously? Again, this wasn't made by Arcane Studios. It was ported by Ubisoft Annecy in 2008, which is in Annecy, France, if you didn't know. Ubisoft Annecy worked on additional content for The Vision 2, ported over Rayman Revolution to the PlayStation 2, and I guess worked on the multiplayer for both Splinter Cell and Assassin's Creed? Two. Now, which games? I don't fucking know. Then they developed some sport games, and I guess they still are? Specifically, two sport games. Ah, thanks, Wikipedia. I can't say much about the port just because I don't know much about it. 
I do know that they made it easier to play and more compatible for the Xbox 360, add completely new levels, enhanced the graphics and lighting, improved the multiplayer, and fixed many of the bugs in the original. Though apparently they're still all bugs with this port, which actually doesn't surprise me all that much. Also, according to the advertisement, Sarah looks like this. Um... I mean, it's not what I was expecting. As far as I know, this version cannot be played on PC. There are no mods or ports to restore this version of the game. Yeah, your best bet is probably an emulator, but damn it, it would be nice to have a better way to play it. So why did I make this video? Then again, why do I make any of my videos? Well, my reason is because this is the only Source game that Arcane Studios made. There were going to be more Source games after this by Arcane. They were working on The Crossing, which nobody really seems to care about because people, as well as myself, are more interested in the other cancelled Source project, and the other being Ravenholm. Ravenholm was cancelled because Valve didn't want to do Half-Life anymore, The Crossing was cancelled because Arcane wanted to help out with LMNO, and that also got cancelled by EA specifically. Damn, they really got fucked over by big game companies now that I think about it. However, these three games helped inspire and create one of my favorite games of all time, Dishonored. But of course, not just Dishonored, most of the other pieces of work after this. I feel like we could have had three masterpieces instead of just one masterpiece. I mean, seriously, look at The Crossing. Victor Antonov helped work on it, and this literally just looks like Dishonored. Like, look, look at it! It's just Dishonored! Of course, the one that hurts the most is Ravenholm, and it really sucks that Arkane will never get another chance to work on a Half-Life game, since they are with Bethesda now, and they seem pretty happy with where they are right now. But that's how I feel about Dark Messiah. It was the beginning step to build a structure, but that structure was never finished. Hell, what Arcane did in Dark Messiah makes me wonder why other developers haven't tried going above and beyond with the Source Engine. Like, what if there was a Half-Life game or a side story of some kind where all your decisions affected the story? Like in Dark Messiah, even though the choice impacts aren't that big of a deal nowadays, but a Half-Life game centered around that idea alone sounds fucking awesome. Hell, I feel like I am leaving out so many things I want to talk about. I could do this all day, but I'm rambling. This video is getting too long. The original plan was to make a short and sweet video, but now it's taking forever. Please somebody help me. My conclusion. As of now in 2021, Dark Messiah is pretty much the closest thing we have to playing Ravenholm in the Crossing. Can Dark Messiah be frustrating and have its awful moments at times? Yes. But Dark Messiah is a good game that could have led to even better games. And I think that is honestly the saddest thing out of all of this. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment down below. I really do enjoy feedback and just what you guys have to say. Anyways, see you next time. Whatever that is, because this channel fucking blows. Also, I have to give props to Dark Messiah. I love how there are so many different ways to kill Leanna. I appreciate that, Arcane. Mad? Ah! Come on, man.